Okay, this is another of Mrs. H's psychology videos. This time it's on ethical considerations when you're studying A-level psychology, but also when carrying out psychological research. So I'm going to use the Prezi presentation again. This time you can go into Prezi and look up uh, ethical considerations for A-level. You'll find it, so if you want to um, spend more time, you can have a look at it there. I'm going to whiz through this fairly quickly, so just pause the video when you want to make your own notes. Okay, so firstly, key terms. What do we mean by ethical issues? What do we mean by an ethics committee? And what is our code of ethics? Okay, so you should know this a little bit from your previous research, from your preparation that you've already done. Pause the video just to check, but have a look at this when you're ready. Okay, so ethical issues arise when there's conflict between the researchers' goals and the participants' rights. An ethics committee is a group with, um, that, that must approve the study before it begins, and our code of ethics is our principles to help professionals behave honestly and with integrity. So look, let's look at this in a bit more detail. Code of conduct um, designed by the BPS, British Psychological Society, um, set up really um, to ensure that we, we have a, um, a competence uh, and we, ha we deal with our participants with respect and responsibility. So respect really making sure that there, we maintain the dignity of all our participants and make sure that they have privacy and informed consent etc etc we'll talk about in a moment. Competence making sure that um, all the researchers uh, keep high, uh, maintain high standards in their professionalism and we also want to look at responsibility. We have a responsibility to make sure that participants um, are safe, that they're not harmed. We have responsibility to this uh, scientific psychology as well as the participants and also our um, integrity that psychologists should remain honest and um, accurate in their in their research findings, um, that they're accurate and they do outline any limitations and obviously any misconduct is passed on to the BPS. So let's look at these in a little bit more detail, the ethical issues. You should be able to um, recount, you should be able to list these the, um, and be able to refer to them with the correct terminology. So we'll look at these in a bit more detail. The first one being informed consent. So those of you using my booklet, I've asked you to find out a little bit more information. You should be able to say and um, account um, the difference between consent and informed consent. So just ensure that you're clear on that. But basically, consent is that you have agreed to take part in research. You may not know exactly what the research aims are and what the details are of the research, um, but that is the difference between informed and consent. So informed consent is where you do know clearly what will be entailed. Um, we also need to make sure that we have um, consent for anyone under 16 from somebody who is responsible for them, so their parent or guardian in most cases, um, but somebody who we call in loco parentis. So for example, in a boarding school environment, that may well be the headmaster, headmistress, um, or a house parent. Okay, ditto with adults with impairments. So they may be adults, but the idea is that, that they would need somebody else making that decision for them. Um, just to make sure that they are not pressurized into taking part, to make sure they are not going to be harmed um, because they're considered not able to make that decision for themselves. So um, researchers are also in a position of, response, uh, of, of authority and therefore they can't put pressure on any participants. So for example, a teacher, um, a lecturer can't put uh, pressure in any form on their participants to, to get them to take part. Um, it should be said also along along those lines that the you can't induce participants to to do something that may be potentially harmful just by paying them. All right, so um, they they really should not be at any further risk than their normal lifestyle. 
if it's possible that there should be unusual discomfort or some sort of embarrassment or something like that, then we need to make sure that we get the disinterested approval of independent advisors, all right, and get real consent from them. And of course, in longitudinal research, consent needs to be um, be gathered more than on one more than on more than one occasion. Sorry. The other thing we should say is how do we go about getting that consent? You need to make sure that you're clear. You say consent should always be in writing from the person in loco parentis and it really should be at every point that you meet them as well. Okay, so um, signed a letter of consent from somebody. Now on my notes I've also asked you to find out about presumptive consent, uh, prior general consent and re retrospective consent. If you're using the Illuminate um, book and materials, the textbook with the green haired girl, then look at page 177 and you've got information there about those three. You do need to make sure you've got that. They're not ideal, those three um, ideas about consent. They're not the ideal position, but, um, but they are ways of also getting consent. So make sure you've got notes on that and we'll check that and we'll clarify that in class. So moving on, next issue is deception. Right, we should not deceive participants. We should try to avoid that wherever possible. Now occasionally there are pieces of research, for example, if you consider Milgram, the um, electric shocks uh, a situation with obedience. Um, it was not, it would have been very difficult, well it was impossible to really to get that particular research done without deception. But th if that is the case then we, we really must consult with people who share the same social and cultural background of the participants. Okay, so advice of ethics, disinterested ethics committees, uh, disinterested colleagues may be sufficient, but really we should be going back to their, their cultural group um, to, to ensure that no offence is going to be caused. Um, participants should never really be deliberately misled without any strong um, justification. All right, and if that is the case, then we have very strict controls. And again, as I, I mentioned, disinterested approval of independent advisors. So just to be certain, if you're going to do research where you want to use some deception, first of all, try to find alternative procedures where you don't need to deceive. Secondly, make sure that participants are provided with sufficient information at the very earliest stage. And thirdly, um, do some consultation, find out whether it's going to cause um, you know, real upset, long-term harm, etc., etc., with a disinterested um, group that, that shares their culture. Moving on from deception, next one we're going to look at is the debrief. Right, contrary to popular um, belief, the debrief does not allow you to be unethical on any aspect. Okay, so you can't just assume that you're going to tell the participants at the end that everything was a hoax, that they're, you know, that they're all right. It doesn't work like that. So debrief doesn't provide justification for anything that's unethical. So debrief is done as soon as possible. Debrief covers obviously things like your thanks and uh, making very clear what the true aim of the research was and giving general information about the results um, so participants are able to ask any questions, things like that. So that's what happens in the debrief. Um, so they uh, get the opportunity to, opportunity to discuss their experiences. Um, and it's also an opportunity for the researchers to just check to make sure that no nobody has been harmed in any way psychologically or, or physically. So then we move on to the right to withdraw. Right, right at the very beginning when you're doing your brief, right at the very beginning when you're getting your participants and then also when you're when you're actually in front of participants, when you're doing your standardized instructions, at every stage the 
participants have the right to withdraw. That includes right at the end when you have their data. If they want it, they have the right to withdraw and it's your role to make sure that is very clearly set out for them. Okay. Um, it may be that they, they're not happy to ta have taken part, maybe that they've changed their minds. Of course, the other thing you should be aware of when testing children, um, they, they may not feel able to say they want to withdraw, um, they, they may be very young and not able to articulate that, and so our avoidance of the testing situation should be taken as evidence that they don't consent to it and they don't want to be part of it and therefore the researchers should ad adhere to that. It should be said that also participants are able to withdraw their data retrospectively, as I've said, right at the end. And moving on to confidentiality. Participants are able, they, they must have the right to, um, for their data to be treated confidentially, for any information to be treated confidentiality, confidentially. So in other words, they are not to be identified in any way. How do we get around that? Well, we give them a, 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 a pseudonym, we give them a number, we give them a code, something like that and obviously their results are not identifiable individually so we, we get mean scores and things like that so that we can't identify any particular individual. Alright, so they should be told that they are their data is anonymous Okay, and um, if that is not possible, so for example if it's been recorded, it's been filmed and it's clear then that information should be made very clear to them that then they are not able to be anonymous and um, the real consent should be given by the participant in that particular case. Moving on, protection from harm. This includes physical harm and psychological harm. So what do we ne mean by that? It means that the harm should be no greater than their ordinary life. So they should not be exposed to any risk, any more risk than they would normally encounter. Um, if there is any more risk, then obviously that has to be made very clear. We get advice again, and um, you know, special care is taken. Um, participants are also also should be given contact details, so that if there is any stress or any potential harm they are able to contact the researchers. And this, you know, could just be very ordinary material. So, for example, participants could be asked quite personal questions. So it's not like they're coming under any physical harm, but that might cause them discomfort, embarrassment, and so they should be told very clearly that they don't have to answer them. So there's all sorts of things that should be considered in that. It's probably worth pointing out also that um, in, in terms of dealing with children, we need to be really careful when we're discussing results because if we make statements that seem a bit evaluative, oh, you know, she did well, he did really well, then it, it could be misconstrued. So we do need to be careful in terms of our, our language when feeding back results. Moving on. We have um, privacy, observational research. Again, um, this observational research should be only restricted to places where people are expecting to be observed. So that doesn't necessarily mean all public places. If you think about it, um, you know, public loos, um, places of worship, you know, they are public, but they wouldn't. People there would not be expected to, to be uh, being observed, and therefore we need to make sure it's just very obvious um, public places uh, where people are expected to be observed where any observation is done by strangers, by our researchers. Okay, so various things we can do and we'll do class work on this but one of the things you need to do now is have a look on the blog um, or if you haven't got that have a look search for little, the Little Albert study 
and just have a think about how the BPS code would have been compromised. Obviously, Little Albert was done in the 1920s before the BPS code was brought into effect. Um, but if it was around today, how would it have been compromised? And once you've done that, have a look at this. So I'm just going to whiz through a little bit of information about non-human animal ethics, all right? So animal ethics, um, which obviously plays a part as well here. So if you, you can have a look at um, these slides. I'm just going to whiz them through pretty quickly. So just pause. OK, and some data for you about how animals are used. These are um, figures from 2009. What sort of animals are used in research? So again, pause on that slide if you want to. Have a look at that. And ditto with this slide. OK, moving on. Why might a psychologist choose to use an animal in their research? Well, obviously, animal research is fascinating in its own right, but we get a lot more control and objectivity with that. Right, if you refer back to Skinner and pigeons and rats. Um, th also, another reason is some people believe ethically it's a little bit more acceptable. Uh, so, for example, we couldn't necessarily do Harlow's research with monkeys with humans. Obviously, this is real, really, really hot debate, and um, different people have very different views on this. But the reason why animals are used is because of their physiology, and you know, because they are so similar to us that we it is believed that we can make these comparisons, do research on animals, and make comparisons. Some people will say, though, and there's a nice little quote from one of your booklets, it says, ask the experimenters why they, they experiment on animals. And the answer is, because the animals are like us. So ask the experimenters why it's morally OK to experiment on animals. And the answer is, because the animals are not like us. So animal experimentation rests on a logical contradiction. That's, professor. That's a quote from Professor Charles Miguel. Okay, moving on. Uh, existing constraints, animal research is very strictly controlled. Um, and we've got slides here. Uh, Scientific Procedures Act 1986, you can have a look at there. And that finishes, that concludes the, um, the slideshow on ethical considerations, which we will we will do more on in class. We'll do more activity on that in class.